Brian said yesterday uh, to start the conference, and even today, a big part of this conference is learning new things. And I think throughout the conference, esports has been brought up. And a lot of times when it is, we're all kind of shaking our heads and saying, we're still trying to figure this out. So it's kind of fitting that our final panel is about the explosion of esports and fantasy leagues. Jeffrey Orridge will, will be the moderator. He's the chairman of Tidal Gaming Group, Premi Gaming Group, previously the commissioner of the CFL and executive director of sports properties at CBC. Mark Arms Mike Armstrong is the VP head of marketing at Overactive Media Group, the former director of sports and digital innovation marketing at CBC. Sumit Arora is the senior director of strategy and analytics at MLSC. So he's in charge of planning and development and execution of innovation strategy and esports business. Dan Hannigan Daly is the director of Sportsbook, Product Draft Kings, and Anthony Trong is the founder of Beat Esports. Internationally, they have many events, including uh, Dota 2 and Overwatch. So it's the explosion of esports. Jeff? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, having all of us here. Appreciate your time and attention. And uh, let me just get the elephant that's in the room out. Um, this is not my new look. Um, it is, it is uh, for November, and for most of you know, it's, uh, it's Men's Health Awareness Month in, in November, and specifically uh, prostate cancer. So um, anyway, so now that I get that out of the way, um, to the panelists, look, most of us in this room have either had a, a myriad of opportunities or will have a myriad of, uh, of choices when it comes to either pursuing an academic career or a professional career. And so I think it's, it's fitting to start off by, by asking each one of our panelists why you got involved in the business that you're in right now, and is it what you expected? Mike? Uh, I can dive in first. Um, so for me, uh, I made the jump into eSports about eight months ago. Uh, I left a, a dream job of mine at, at Google to dive in to be an a eight person at a Toronto-based startup. Uh, so it was quite a jump going from a big org like Google into a, a very, very small esports company. Um, for me, the move was really uh, driven by um, I want to be a part of something that's new and taking shape uh, and be a part of uh, creating uh, what that new industry is. And I'd say if you're in the esports industry, you're helping shape the, the industry, uh, new sports franchises. Uh, and for me, that's uh, something that I think is um, uh, quite difficult to get in a career. Uh, so uh, I'd say so far it's been expected in that it's been a wild, crazy six or seven months uh, with uh, some daunting moments uh, because at some times uh, in this industry we're, we're doing things that haven't been done uh, exactly the way that we're doing it before. So it's, uh, it's been, um, I'd say, as advertised for me. <laughs> Um, so, working in sports, we really got exposed to eSports first about three years ago when at what was then the Air Canada Centre, we held a, a massive event uh, for League of Legends. And it really, you know, blew our minds and opened our eyes to this uh, event that sold out, you know, in like 30 seconds and it was full all weekend. Um, you know, it was the type of business that we would see for like a playoff game, but instead of, you know, beer and hot dogs, it was a lot of Red Bull and Twizzlers for uh, several hours. and. Uh, it was just eye-opening, so we spent some time just studying and asking, you know, if this was for real. And by the time we kind of came to the conclusion this is for real, you know, the NBA came knocking and said they wanted to launch a, a professional, you know, esports league. And so for me to kind of just dive in and, and help uh, our team, it was really neat to, as an experience to just put together a franchise and, and launch a franchise in a league from scratch, and you know, hire somebody who's going to go and build the team and help evaluate people to draft and. You know, it's, it's, it's a fun opportunity to learn something on the fly. You've got a little bit of freedom to fail because we're doing it for the first time. Um, and now what's evolved is, you know, working at MLSC used to be the kind of company where when you go to a cocktail party or a holiday party, everybody my age wanted to come and talk to me about my job. Now it's their kids. So it's, uh, it's a little different. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, for me personally, I got into eSports back in 2011. Um, we decided, so we just graduated university we wanted to make an extra, some extra side money. Uh, we decided to launch a community platform to service the infrastructure needs of, for gamers. Um, that took off. We didn't really get much traction regarding that. Um, so we decided that, hey, there's a real demand in eSport events. 
uh, specifically online. So we kind of explored that. We started off with Dota 2. Uh, we moved into Overwatch. And then after that, our career just kind of took off in the esports landscape. Um, we, so we, yeah, we wanted to really provide a service because we noticed a lot of tournament organizers in the past, they kind of treated their players unethically. They had kind of, like, they didn't really have the best practice to how to run events. So we decided to, we wanted to change that. We wanted to bring light towards the um, tournaments in North America and internationally. And we wanted to do so, you know, quickly and effectively. Um, so that's how we got into esports. So for DraftKings, kind of our, our MO is really just bringing, bringing fans closer to the games that they already love. So we have a fantasy sports product that's been live for around seven years now. And in 2015, uh, we launched a League of Legends product. And it's done relatively well. Um, we haven't really invested as much time and effort into it as maybe we probably would have otherwise. We've had to deal with a lot of sort of regulatory changes that have sort of arisen. And very recently, um, in 2018, uh, Basically, laws in the states were changed that allowed for states to legalize and re uh, regulate sports, sports wagering. So we launched a product in New Jersey in 2018, and initially, uh, eSports was kind of on the banned list as far as uh, what sports and leagues that you could actually offer wagering on. And only just last week, or I guess it was 10 days ago now, for the League of Legends world, did we finally get approval to offer, offer wagering on that. And the way that we're kind of viewing the world at this stage as far as eSports goes is that we've built our our platform to be kind of scalable and flexible to allow for any sort of competition to be uh, kind of integrated into that experience. And we're still very much early days. There's a lot of education, I would say, as far as dealing with regulators to ensure that they understand what esports actually are and that it is a, a sport and a competition that has a lot of the sort of protections in place to allow either fantasy or wagering on specifically. Great, thanks. Um, I've been involved in, in various levels of sport um, in various sports for almost 35 years now. And one of the reasons why I got involved in, in eSports is because for me, it seems like the perfect nexus of sport, entertainment, um, technology, uh, and media. And each one of those areas is something that I've been involved with uh, throughout my career. So it, it seemed to, to all coalesce at the same time in something that, you know, as Mike mentioned, it's new and exciting. And, uh, and it is ever changing. And, uh, and we're still trying to figure out the, the, the rules of the road in so many ways. Um, so the Super Bowl got 98 million viewers last year. Uh, the League of Legends Championship got 200 million viewers. Um, Sumit mentioned uh, that, uh, that the League of Legends Championship sold out. Um, the previous sellout record was Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, and I think they sold out in 30 seconds, and League of Legends sold out quicker than that. So this theme of the panel is the explosion of esports. So to what do you attribute the, the explosion of esports? What do you think is fueling it? And, uh, and what, what would you identify as, as, as the top three reasons? why there's such a meteoric rise in, in the popularity of esports. I could dive in on this one. Um, so for me, I think uh, originally it was availability of streaming. Uh, if we go back to late 90s, early 2000s, uh, streaming at live events was very costly. Uh, Twitch comes along, uh, and in 2011, taking the League of Legends as an example, um, League of Legends went from 2 million to uh, 32 million viewership in two years. Um, so two years, 16x explosion. Um, for me, that's a, a match that lit off um, esports as an industry. I think recently, from what I've seen, uh, it's a lot of um, esports just um, transcending into mainstream. Uh, is is a, a big driver. Uh, so whether that's um, esports um, being in the, the Simpsons this past year, um, Ballers on HBO, um, uh, just um, late night TV shows, uh, it's starting to transcend into mainstream culture. Uh, and then um, I'm not good at keeping count, as you can tell. Uh, but the uh, the I'd say the the last thing for me is. Um, we're, uh, we're starting to see um, just more maturity uh, to the business models backing esports. Um, so as a, as a result, I'd say that that's getting more investment uh, and making the ec economics of the industry uh, make more sense, and that's helping build up the industry. Great. Simi? I mean, if you look at sports just in general and the evolution, 
you know, you say 200, 250 years ago, people would play games. And about 150 years ago, when you look at leagues like the CFL and Major League Baseball, people started saying, I want to watch somebody else play a game and, play, and pay for it. And then I want to watch it on a screen with the advent of television. And then with the internet, it's I want to be able to consume that as a fan anywhere, anytime that I want. That evolution that took 200 or 250 years to happen for pro sports has happened probably in about 10 years for esports. And uh, from, you know, and it's not to nerd out here, but from people all having video game consoles at home or playing on a PC to broadband internet to social media and being able to share content and upload video, all of that accelerated in real time that, you know, the competitiveness of esports, the social aspect of gaming as a cultural kind of lens now has just ex accelerated so quickly. It's never been easier for something to, a movement to become popular and you can share it with everybody else. And I think what I love about esports, like, like pro sports, it's created this, this tribalism. This, it brings people together because there are people that are just deeply passionate about something. And we've now created this um, opportunity um, for that to, to manifest itself, not just from something you do as a, as a social activity, but as a competitive activity, and then as a commercial activity as well. Adding on to that, um, I think what attributed to the successful, the explosion of esports is the fact that it's so accessible. Anyone that has a computer or a mobile phone would have direct access to esports. They can download the game, they can play with their friends, they can you know, play during class. So like, if I wanted to play hockey, I would have to find a venue, get a group of friends, and probably rent a goalie. Um, but <laughs> in esports, you don't really have those barriers to entry. Um, in addition to that, um, what really attributes to the explosion of esports is the marketing done by the AAA companies. Um, so Valve does the International, which is a renowned Dota 2 tournament. Um, Blizzard Entertainment does Overwatch League and Overwatch World Cup. And these brings in so much media, international media, from other, I guess, other parts of the world that it just kind of culminates together and everyone comes together to watch these events. Yeah, and for me, I think the biggest thing really is that just sort of consumption patterns are changing quite rapidly. And obviously that's, that's driven to a large extent by technological advances, but no longer, and even in just traditional sports, no longer do fans really... Uh, feel, feel sufficient that they just simply watch a game. I mean, who sits there and watches a three-hour game now with, with no other engagement within the actual experience there? There's the second screen experience that's really, really, really uh, important and relevant for that, for that fan as they're watching their, their games. And I think just with eSports, similar to the accessibility of it, it's really that it's something, something that's more immersive than just simple traditional sports and watching those games sort of on TV. Great. So um, I read the statistic recently that uh, about 2 billion people, over 2 billion people uh, around the globe identify themselves as gamers, whether they watch or, or participate. When you think about it, there's about 8 billion people in the world. So one quarter of those um, identify themselves as being involved in, in esports in, in some way, shape, or form. So you mentioned technology as a key driver, um, accessibility, right? I mean, compression technology, streaming, um, getting uh, handheld devices or mo mobile devices in the hands of, of a lot more people. Um, Google had launched Loom, right? Um, and that was being able to send up balloons um, that had Wi-Fi connectivity for remote areas and, and, uh, and rural areas. How do you think that that has, has augmented what's happening in, 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 in the digital sports space, or, or does it really matter? Or who's, who's the, the typical demographic who's watching and playing? Is it people in rural areas? Is it people in urban areas? I, I mean, I think there's a couple of things there. Um, so one is, I think, to, to your point about accessibility, and esports is something that, that it's accessible, and we're seeing it's cutting across geographic boundaries. It's cutting across urban versus rural. I, I think if, if in many cases, esports is what's driving rapid rural adoption of things like broadband internet. You're not, you don't have a lot of 15-year-olds saying, I want satellite television or I want you know, fiber optic you know, or high-speed TV. It's I want to be able to play video games with my friends or with my online friends. And so I think it, it's now gone from reflecting kind of technology evolution to actually dictating it. Um, you know, esports is going to drive the next evolution of mobile. 
because we've gotten as far as we can really in, in video gaming really without mobile being other than the fan friendly that you know you can talk about the the games that you can play for fun but that competitive esports mobile you know step is yet to come but it's going to come because of of esports so i think from to that part of your question it's definitely you know reaching everybody wherever they are i think from a cultural standpoint i think it's just interesting to, that it's also crossing demographic boundaries as well i think that whatever you think in this audience the percentage of gamers that are female your answer is wrong it's higher Whatever your answer is, what the average age is, your answer is wrong, it's older. I think it's something that we're seeing that cuts across what we think are sort of stereotypical demographic you know, uh, boundaries, because we, we are now in this generation, like how many people in this audience here actually have played video games Recre like, for fun? It's not just a young person, it's not a 15 year old, it's a 35 year old. You know, it's someone older than that. Um, some of us are older than 35, but we won't talk about them, right? But we, it's something that's been around for a long time. We're talking about video games have been around since, the, you know, they're late 70s, early 80s now. So we're in like generation two or three of it as a culture. So I think that, you know, we're getting surprised every day by the people that are fans that we can actually look at as potential customers as well. Yeah, yeah just building on that, um, some Canadian research we just did um, to highlight some of those points. I mean, we saw 40% of uh, esports fans in Canada are women. Uh, so that was a stat that came out um, of new Canadians. Sixty percent of them are into esports. Um, parents, uh, I mean, young millennials um, are a big allotment of that. It was around thirty-five percent. So it isn't that stereotype of uh, that we put in a box and say like this is the esports fan. It's uh, quite different from that. I don't need to paint the picture. You all get it. Uh, but it's uh, it is actually more of an e for everybody uh, type establishment. Yeah, Anthony, I've got a question. You host, your, your company hosts tournaments, right? Yes, we do. Who's your typical client or, and customer, and are they the same? Um, so, actually, no, they wouldn't be the same. So, right now, our customers are actually sponsors and game developers, to say the short. Um, so, sponsors are kind of like the cornerstone of any eSport events. They bring in a lot of the funding, a lot of the hardware. They kind of what powers your event. And in exchange, we give them the kind of um, views that they would that they pay for. Uh, when I say game developers, that just means that they're kind of trusting us to portray their game in a positive light. Um, so whenever we broadcast an event, we have to ensure that the event goes smoothly for the developer, and then we actually work with the developer to kind of narrow out kinks and any like defects that they could have with their game, just to make the experience better. Just in case they wanted to move it to like a bigger stage, we can iron out those kinks in our event. Uh, in terms of our audience, um, it would be just the gamer and the viewers, as we, touched, as we all touched upon earlier. Um, for the gamer, they just kind of, they're just kind of the enthusiasts of esports. And then you have the viewer that are just the more casual uh, fans that are viewing the event. So as to Mike's point, you know, 40% are female, and then those are the kind of casual um, kind of viewers that would watch our events. Dan, I've got a, a specific question for you. So in, in fantasy sports, the NFL, a lot of people attribute the growth and the popularity of, of the NFL to sports wagering and, and, and gambling. And then obviously the admin of, of fantasy. Um, what do you think the impact is for, for, for esports now? I think we're really just at the beginning of that sort of journey. Um, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's a lot of education and sort of restricted regulations currently that are inhibiting a, a little bit of the growth on the, the fantasy side for esports. One example being we have an Android app in the Google Play Store in the US and we're not allowed to actually have our esports uh, fantasy games available from that, from that application due to Google policy. So I think there's, a, there's still a lot of education that's, that's needed to get us to a point where regulators who are, who are overseeing the products that, that we have at DraftKings are comfortable with us to be able to offer fantasy and, and wagering on those different games. There's a huge underground market for all of this, not necessarily underground, I guess, offshore, offshore betting, maybe not so much on the fantasy side, but certainly on the, on the betting side, there's, there's a lot of activity that goes on there. But I think there's certainly going to be a lot of growth, and I think it's going to be important for esports in general when it does come to that stage that we're able to get those regulations that will will actually organically help grow esports alongside the wagering aspect of it too. Yeah. So um, I guess this should probably be directed mainly to, to Mike and Sumit, I think. Um, I've got a question that says, 
you know, traditional sports have developed fan bases rooted in local and regional geographies. Can esports engender the same type of team fandom, even though it's so global and, and disparate and there's so many games? I mean, if you want to be a professional hockey player, there's really one place to play, and that's the NHL. If you want to be a professional football player, arguably there are two places to play, the CFL and the NFL, right? But if you want to be a professional gamer, um, you know, you can be in League of Legends, you can be in, in Fortnite, and there's, there are new games and new titles coming up all the time. How do you engender that, that loyalty and that, that multi-generational um, attachment and engagement in something like esports? You start. Paul. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll dive in. Um, I think there's one aspect that's relatively new that's interesting on uh, a driver of what pulls fans in. Um, I uh, spent a lot of money on a fan segmentation analysis just recently, so it's top of mind for me. Um, but um, I was very curious to your question around um, city uh, and what impact does the city that an esports franchise have on pulling fan fans in? No different from any other sport. Uh, what we found was one of the largest uh, fan segments that uh, had the biggest opportunity. Uh, their number one driver for why they would follow our teams locally um, was rooted in an aspect of pride. Now, pride was multifaceted in that a little bit of it was pride that esports is like for my generation. And as esports grows, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud and validated that it's growing. Um, the second aspect of it was exactly that. They were proud that uh, our teams were, uh, are representing the city of Toronto. Um, so I, I do think that there is um, uh, an element of city pride that we're going to see that, that does connect people to esports teams uh, from a locality perspective. So yeah. you, you, MLSE is, is fairly heavily invested in, in this enterprise, and, and you've got a team, right? And, and you actually... Do you house them in a certain place? Yeah, and yeah. So um, we have a NBA 2K league. So the NBA has got you know four leagues that they operate: the NBA, the WNBA, the G League, and now they have the 2K league. And the 2K league is uh, uh, we have professional teams that compete, play in the NBA 2K franchise, and uh, they are local markets. So we've got you know 22 NBA franchises that are part of it. And this year, for the first time, we've got a North American Sports League that added an international franchise. Um, based in China with, with an established esports organization, Genji, that's, that's come into the fold. Um, when I think about your question, you know, I kind of look at the landscape that we have in pro sports you know, today in Toronto. And hockey is a multi-generational you know, game. There are, our, our society generally, our, our grandparents, people that grew up here, and if their families have been here for multi-generation, it's a game that you've inherited through your family and through their parents, and you know, it's, it's several generations. When I think about you know, baseball, it's sort of something that, you know, again, maybe that second generation. Basketball, we saw this with the Raptors this year. I mean, a lot of people came to embrace the Raptors, but it's still sort of an adopted sport for a lot of people. There is a small group of people that have grown up playing basketball or had a grassroots connection, but it's something that people discovered along the time, you know. So if somebody asked you 30 years ago whether or not Toronto is a basketball town, they probably would have said no. But putting a team in Toronto, building an identity, building a fan experience that connected to people, that grew something, that meant something, we're seeing the results of that now, you know, 25 years later, where it's a basketball town. And I think when I look at esports, I think it's the same thing, which is whether or not there's a local market for it today or not, you bring something, especially in a market like ours, you know, we're, we're, we're now a city of winners, right? We want winning. We want something to feel proud of. And I think you put anything out there that's something that's fun to enjoy, it's something you can get passionate about, it's competitive, it helps us be better than Boston, you know, we'll, we'll take it, right? Um, so anything but Boston, right? But uh, the, uh, I think, so I think there's a market for esports to become more localized. I think what's interesting about esports and, and pro sports is everybody wants what the other side, you know, has right now. And so, we're, you know, pro sports is looking at how to get more digital, how to create more fan engagement outside of just the number of games that you play, always on any channel. We want to be global. We want to be the most popular Raptor, you know, hockey team and basketball team and soccer team and football team in the world. And, and that's an aspirational goal for us. So how do we get beyond the market and think about you know, fans wherever they are when you've got um, eSports you know, titles and, and games that have a fan base that's everywhere and you want to regionalize it? 
You know, so I think it's just an interesting convergence right now because I think we're trying to do both. And, and I think which, whichever side you are, you're doing the same thing. Okay. Anthony, it looks like you had, you had a thought on that. No, no thoughts. <laughs> so, so, so let me ask you guys a question. So traditional sports and esports and the rise of esports and the maturity of the traditional sports market, um, particularly ball and, and, uh, and, and stick sports, um, cannibalism or brand extension? I think it's Dan, let me start with you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're in all these sports. I would imagine that, uh, certainly for us anyways, we see a lot of incrementality whenever we add new sports or new leagues, certainly on the, on the fantasy side. We launched Arena Football League, uh, I want to say this past season. Uh, we'll probably launch something like the XFL coming up. Uh, and it's certainly not taking away from people who are going to play NBA. If you play NBA fantasy, you're going to continuously play NBA fantasy. And I think with eSports, at least from the, the numbers that we have based on League of Legends today, it's a, it's a different demographic, so it's actually bringing in new users for us, and then the users who like fantasy or just like to get engaged with whatever sorts of sports that we offer, they're going to jump over as well, and it's going to be incremental value to their experience and then obviously to, to the operator DraftKings. Any, any concern from any of you that, that you're siphoning off some of your fan base to, to another sport, getting them involved in in virtual sport as opposed to traditional sport, and uh, no longer having that, that desire to go out and, and go to the stadium or, or the arena and spend an inordinate amount of time and money um, on a ticket and where you can just sit in the, the luxury of your home or uh, in the convenience of your home and just still participate in a competitive event in some way, shape, or form. Any concern about that? I, I guess building on the last one, I still see it as, as uh, additive. Uh, and I think if we look at uh, media uh, and just fragmentation in general, I think people are just adding more. Uh, and they might be doing less of each, but I think it's an additive game versus a, a subtraction game. So for me, I think they're still going to go to that stadium and watch um, a, a traditional sport. Uh, but they're also going to spend some time on esports. So I like to think the story is additive versus a, a subtraction game uh, on losing something entirely uh, and more just how you divvy up your time. No different from how we're seeing um, uh, TV and the media world change uh, where there's just a whole number of different ways that we can consume uh, media. I mean, we, we have obviously multiple teams and they, each of those teams have a very different fan identity. So I think that, you know, I don't think you need to pick a lane. I, mm -hmm. I think we're able to get a deeper relationship with our fans, and the more that we know what our fans are interested in, we're able to find ways to deliver that experience to them. So if you're a Raptor fan who happens to be an eSports fan, let's find a way to have an eSports conversation with you that connects with you, and it just builds a, a greater, deeper relationship with us. If you're the child of a Leaf fan who hasn't, you know, been interested in hockey and there's a risk of us not having a relationship with you, let's find a way to introduce something to you that we think can build a relationship. But I don't think you have to make a choice. I think, um, in or I, I think in general, any business, but especially in a, in a sports and entertainment business, you're always thinking about diversifying because you want to try to build a relationship with as many fans that are out there and give your, your fans and your customers what they want. As an esports fan as well, adding on to that, um, I think it's very valuable kind of going to that stadium experience and having that interaction with you know, like-minded people around you, kind of sharing one common goal and sharing one common interest is a very important thing. Um, right now, currently, like going back to what you said, Jeffrey, you said um, in the Scotiabank Arena, the League of Legends tournament sold out in less than 30 seconds, and I think that's a fascinating stat. Um, that just shows you how popular the game is, how popular people want to come together and enjoy the teams that are playing for the event. I'm curious, actually, do you know if, those, those fans going to that event monetize the same way that a set of hockey fans actually go? I would imagine it's fairly different consumption patterns. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell you, the, like, I was not kidding when I said what we see for a basketball game in terms of like, food and beverage and retail, we saw the same thing for League of Legends. It was just different food. Right. And, it, and I'm not kidding, it wasn't alcohol, it was you know, Red Bull right? or other energy drinks. So like, it is, the monetization, I think, is the last piece of the puzzle. And I think when people talk to me about esports and, and where it's going, 
you know, whether you're an investor, whether you're a partner, whether you're, you know, even a fan who's just interested in seeing this grow as an industry, if you do every other part of it well, the, the, the money will come. And I think if we're honestly, what I respect the most about the industry is that it is so democratized because it has been something where you have that feedback loop. It hasn't been the world of pro sports where maybe it was built, built on, you know, TV ratings and, you know, it's built on audience and participation and, and, and you know, the, it's a two-way interaction. If you see a, a broadcast on Twitch, you can see the commentary happening in real time. It will tell you right away whether something's hitting the mark or not. <laughs> and from a competitive standpoint or just from an influencer standpoint. So I think that feedback loop has created such a focus on being authentic and being organic that you, know, you build a real, real passion around it. And I think like everything else, when you put your heart and soul into building a good product, uh, you build a good you know, fan base and then you'll be profitable. Cool. Sumit, so you mentioned um, it's organic, right? What happens when something organic morphs into something organized um, and rules and regulations and policies and, and commissionerships evolve and, and all kinds of, of, of other things. Do you think it will enhance digital sports or serve to be an impediment in the short term by, by putting barriers and, and guidelines that didn't exist? which have allowed it to grow at the, at the yeah. pace it's gone. Uh, the NBA 2K League is a great case study for that. So when we launched the league, the broadcast experience was basically what you would see watching a traditional basketball game, left to right. Because people, when we launched the league, the assumption was that's what basketball is like when you're watching it. And the viewership wasn't there. And because trying to jump really, you know, quickly to finding new fans versus catering to your fans, there's a huge online audience of NBA 2K you know, community that watches it, but what are they watching? People playing, they play north-south. So, you know, two, three weeks into the season, they switched the, the broadcast angle, and sure enough, the viewership spiked. And it's a great example of a pro sport league being humble enough to recognize, okay, we gotta stay true to our, our community. It's a great example of an esports audience telling you in real time what's not working, and from an innovation standpoint, okay, you fail quick, you fail fast, but you pivot and you keep learning. And it was a great experience, and that's what I think you're allowed to do in this space. But that's the right way of adding that professionalism on. Don't lose the heart and soul of it, but understand what it is at the heart of it, and then you know you can build a little bit of a shell around it without, you know, sucking the energy out of it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just to build in, uh, we we've seen the same thing from an Overwatch League perspective over the last 24 months. Um, the audience figures uh, speak for themselves, just on the organization of the league itself. Uh, I would uh, echo, though, the feedback that you do need to have the, the balance of the endemic eSport voice uh, as well as the you know, professionals who've worked in traditional sport uh, in, the, uh, in the past and make sure that there's a marriage of those two, uh, yeah. those two, those two types of people. Anthony? Um, for me personally, um, we deal a lot with online events. So we kind of get the brute force of the feedback right in the Twitch chat. Whenever something goes wrong with sound, whenever something goes wrong with production, we hear the bulk end of it. Um, it gives us a reactionary time to kind of fix it quickly. And uh, that's, that's what kind of we rely on for kind of getting the feedback from the customer. Yeah, and from my perspective, I, I think that's certainly interesting just understanding that, that entire feedback loop. Well, so, certainly a little bit of a different sort of setup for, for how I would experience in that Whenever our application has an issue, we know about it right away because Twitter will blow up and obviously our KPIs will drop pretty, pretty significantly pretty quickly um, based on you know, if it's whatever, 12.47 on a, on a Sunday morning or a Sunday in advance of an NFL kickoff. And just understanding that you, you must be able to make those adaptations right in the moment I think is, is really important. And it's kind of interesting to hear some of these perspectives. For me, I'm, I'm not a, a huge gamer by any means. I'm certainly more of into the traditional sports. And it would be wonderful, I would say, if something like the NFL could actually make some of the rule changes more on the fly, like what is pass interference right yeah. now? Nobody really <laughs> knows. Um, so it's really interesting just to hear how the leagues have actually adapted themselves. There's probably some sort of congruency here that would make, make a really, really positive impact to all the, the leagues involved, I guess. Yeah, I, I will say, I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about how esports can become more like pro sports, but I, wanna, I think it's more important for pro sports to learn how to be like esports. 
getting behind the curtain, getting accessibility to the personalities, getting more two-way interaction, you know, that always on, you know, passion. We need to learn more about what drives that successfully in esports because that's where the passion is. And I think that we're doing a lot of the other way, which is great. And I think it's excellent for esports as an industry to grow. But, you know, there are old franchises, there are old games and leagues that could really reinvent themselves on the fly by being more innovative. I think taking a little bit more risks and, and listening to your fans. And, and I think it's something that we're trying to do uh, in real time. And, and I think it's, that's, I think the biggest breath of fresh air esports has brought to, um, to pro sports has been an opportunity to look at doing something a different way. So accessibility, mobility, analytics, technology in general has, has allowed esports to, to grow at, the, at an accelerated pace. So looking forward, what would be the things that you would hope for in terms of innovation that would take your specific business to that next level? Why don't we start with, uh, with you, Dan? For DraftKings, I, I think kind of what takes our business to the, to the next stage is, is actually fairly simple, just because of the regulatory changes that are occurring and in North America, specifically in the US right now. On the innovation side, I mean, we're, we're at our heart uh, a sports technology company, so we have a lot of different wings of, of, of groups that are working on different things. And as, as technology is emerging, I can't really say what that next thing is necessarily going to be. Um, but I think it's going to be really interesting just as we continue to see changes in the consumption patterns of users and of sports fans wanting that really immersive experience and wanting to have some skin in the game, which we certainly see when we, when we launched in the state of Indiana not that long ago. Within an hour of our launch, we had over 1,000 users placing bets on the platform, which I thought was really, really interesting. It just shows that there's a, a desire to get... To get, that, to get that skin in the game. And I think as we make it more accessible um, and obviously lean into some of the technological advances that are upcoming, whether it's 5G or the like, um, I think that's where we'll see a lot of benefit. Anthony? Um, for me, I think maybe uh, Mike and Summit can help me with this, but player unions. Uh, right now, eSports is kind of a gray area with uh, professional athletes. Do you really call them professional athletes? Uh, in my opinion, they are. However, they may not be treated like that. Um, <clears throat> another thing I mentioned is, while they are while they are professional athletes, um, do they like like right now? A lot, a lot of professional at, like these esports athletes, they get they don't they might not get paid in like they might not get a salary and maybe submit. And Dan, you can talk more about that. You know, running the Toronto Uprising and Toronto Defiant. Um, so I think, in general, the industry is going to keep growing. Yeah. I, I think that, going back to my point earlier, where if you do everything the right way from the start, you're set up as that growth happens in real time. So I think that what level of professional esports organizations have occurred so far are doing things the right way. And I think that when you look at, one thing I think that's really fascinating is if you, there's a perception, we talked about the stereotype of esports athletes as being inactive or sedentary or something. And I think whether it's you know, Mike's teams or our teams and our athletes, we really focus on healthy, active living. And we've made sure that they get training and they get physical fitness and nutrition and mental wellness support. Um, you know, onboarding, coming to a new market and playing and being mentally prepared to, to be a professional and having those life skills, I think are all really important. So I think we recognize, again, a lot of times what you've seen in other sports has been a, about correcting some of the missteps. And I think what we're trying to do in our organization from a value standpoint is just do it right the first time and treat people well the, the right way from the beginning um, so there isn't any inequity in, in terms of how they're perceived to be you know, treated. Um, I think going back to the question, the biggest next thing that's going to help us is we stop treating esports as this, this new thing sitting on the, on the desk over there in the corner and it's part of what we are. You know, I had a conversation just before this panel about um, our plans for immersing esports into our you know, community programs with kids because it's not a choice. You know, I have kids and my kids don't make a choice between being gamers or being athletes or being students. A healthy, active lifestyle allows you to balance all of those things. So I think that the more that we see this as something that's just part of our lifestyle and it's just another aspect of our lives like music, like sports, like that, just it's something that we do. It's something that's part of who we are as an identity. The easier it is for us to kind of take it to the next level because we spend less time explaining what it is and more time figuring out how to do it well. Yeah. 
Mike, um, before we get to our last question, um, I just want you to, to chime in. Um, so what would be the single most innovative thing that you could hope for to, uh, to raise uh, over active media? Take that to the next level. Yeah. Um, I, I think for us, like there's lots of folks talking about AR, VR, and application within eSports, which I think could be interesting. Um, before we go there though, I, I really do have to go back to mobile. Uh, I think that mobile will continue to drive um, these franchises, the franchises behind the games that, that we're backing, um, and create more accessibility. Um, mobile eSports was something that was brought up earlier, which I think is really interesting. If you look at uh, other countries within the world, uh, we're seeing mobile eSports is actually uh, starting to take off. Uh, and it might seem um, peculiar uh, right now to think about people playing competitively on their mobile phones, but it's a, it's a real thing that I think will um, create more um, accessibility, uh, more people involved in the eSports space. Uh, so I'd, I'd say the continued evolution of, of mobile esports uh, would be something that would probably help the entire industry. Great. Yeah. So every organization that I've ever worked for has always talked about, no matter what product or service that organization has, the most the single most important asset is people. Right. Everybody talks about that, even though usually the human um, the human resources department is the most woefully underfunded, but. It's another story. Let me ask you guys, you guys are all in a growth industry and there are many people who were here who were looking at career options and choices, whether it's you know, upon graduation or, or thinking about shifting careers. What attributes do you look for in a, not a candidate, but a successful um, contributor in your organization? Go first. Uh, I mean, for me, from an attribute, it's um, like courage. There's uh, a whole lot of change fast. So if you're not going to speak up, um, you're, um, you're not going to be contributing as much as you could. Uh, curiosity is a big one for me as well. And then um, obsession with data. Uh, data is the lifeblood of most organizations right now. I think uh, when I specifically look to hire within sports marketing, I think sports marketing and marketing in general has become a special team sport. Uh, you've got uh, programmatic media experts, you have performance marketers, you've got content people, you've got layers within marketing. And finding really sharp, good marketing generalists is becoming harder and harder to find. So I look for attributes, but also look for marketing generalists uh, in a world where marketers are becoming much more specialized. Great. Um, if I meet people, you know, I'm going through a hiring process right now. Uh, we're hiring for an esports role, and, and it's a, a specialized role. Anybody that's going to sit down and you know for that interview, I already know they're smart, and I already know they're hardworking. Like if you don't have those two things, you shouldn't bother applying to a job in any field, you know, anymore. So what are the things you're looking for instead? You're looking for cultural values. You're looking for passion. You know, there are a lot of great resumes that I see where when I was at that stage of the career, they were stronger than I ever was. But if they don't have that real keen focus and energy and passion on what they're trying to do. It's not I want this job because it's an opening and I want to be able to do it. It's I care about making this job and doing it better than anybody else in the world. I think just we're at a point in any stage in our career, you have to care about what you do to the point that you want to do it as well as you can. And you, we owe it to you in that role to help you be the best version of yourself. You know, so I think that's really important to bring the energy, but also to make sure that somebody is going to counter that energy with a commitment to making you better as well. Anthony? I think um, two major skill sets that can be life-changing, not only to esports, but to really any job, um, is the ability to set, sell and the ability to create content. Um, if you're able to sell for maybe to get sponsorships, to raise capital for your organization, you can really put that money to building more content. Can your content build a compelling narrative? And if you can kind of show the employer that you can do those two things, um, that's, it, it's gonna really help you Get a role in e or get a job in esports. I think for for me certainly the ability to collaborate is a is a, a skill that's necessary in, in any walk of life and certainly within within the, an organization like DraftKings that's that's inherently valuable and it's really necessary if you want to be successful there and then really the other the other sort of quality that we're always looking for certainly on the product side uh, product and technology is is a bias for action and. And a willingness to actually try something, fail and learn, try, fail, learn, continuously kind of uh, evolve along that life cycle. I think that's really important for us because 
especially in the digital age, in the digital world that we, that we play in, you can do a lot of experimentation and analysis and continuously evolve the product and the experiences that you actually have. And so you need that initial jump and, and to be okay with actually saying, yeah, you know what, I was wrong and that's fine. Great. Um, I think we have some time for questions. I'll ask a question, of course. It's Tony. Um, I think uh, interesting question uh, about uh, platforms and its impact. So I think we have had some popular platforms that stay for a while, but is there a concern about how platforms turn over? I mean, hockey's been around for hundreds of years, but, you know, will Overwatch or any of the other games still be around in five years, right, as they turn over? And what's the impact on both the players as, um, you know, you might be great at one game, but then suddenly the game's not popular and, you know, you're sort of not relevant anymore and also the impact um, on fans because I think that ultimately you make a connection with people and so, you know, you root for Mitch Marner or um, whoever, like, like key players, um, how does that affect that connection with fans? Yep. Anybody? I can take that one. Felt a little directed at Overwatch, so I'll dive in. Uh, uh, from our perspective, uh, when we look at uh, games like League of Legends uh, and legacy uh, video games that have been around for a lot of years, uh, we see um, them lasting. Uh, so for us, uh, we don't have that concern. Um, part of that is because um, of the publishers and the, the continued support of the publishers behind these games. Uh, so when you look at some of these franchises like League of Legends, Call of Duty, um, like they're, um, they're already starting to cross generations. Um, so we see that continuing to happen. That said, uh, I have no crystal ball, so time will tell uh, is, is uh, I guess, the short answer. I think also um, these skills that gamers kind of cultivate, they are transferable in a sense that you have Overwatch and then you have Overwatch 2 that's releasing. So you're gonna have a large population of the, the athletes from Overwatch 1 moving to Overwatch 2. And we've kind of seen that with um, StarCraft, we've kind of seen that with Dota. So I think that's gonna happen in the future that you know, these skills are transferable as long as they can kind of play in a team environment, as long as they have like, the hand-eye coordination and they don't, they, don't get, they don't get too old. Yeah. They can, they can rock any sport. Yeah, but at, at the same time, um, there is a, a finite um, amount of years that an esports athlete um, will actually be at the top of his game. But it's not unlike or dissimilar to traditional sports, right? They may start younger, you know, at 14 or 15, um, but that's not much younger than, uh, than now they're cultivating basketball players and, and, and hockey players. And the average life of, uh, of an NFL player is what, 4.7 years or something like that. Um, so there will be turnover with, with, with athletes, uh, competitors, um, but also the publishers have a vested interest in making sure there are certain games that have a really long, long tail, right? Because they've invested a lot in building that brand as well. So I think they will make a concerted effort to make sure that they narrow the marketplace. Sorry. Hi, uh, Daniel from George Brown College. Um, I was wondering if you guys had an opinion on the difference between um, sort of the grassroots esports industry versus the, I'm gonna use the term forced, I don't, I'm tr I can't think of a different one, a forced uh, league system, which um, I don't mean to come for your neck here, but like we're seeing with Overwatch where Blizzard is leagueifying immediately as opposed to perhaps uh, Dota 2 or uh, League of Legends or even going back to the late 90s, um, StarCraft Brood War, where those started with um, very, very grassroots, you're really playing for the passion, you're playing for a mouse pad or a keyboard, as opposed to right now where you have, I believe uh, the International Nine last year had a $34 million prize pool, and um, that's crowdfunded, but it's so, so different um, and funded by the company rather than what I suppose the way esports started. Yeah, and now there are prize pools that are between 100 million and 300 million, so, mm -hmm. John? I mean, for me, I think it comes down to um, the maturity of the industry and uh, this being a, a necessity uh, to organize and continue to grow esports for the greater population. I'd say earlier on from a Overwatch side, there, there was some feeling of, of, of forced that's gone away. We're feeling it again now today uh, with Call of Duty uh, as the Call of Duty League is rolling out. Uh, and uh, those that are endemic are feeling like their, their world is shifting 
beneath their feet and they have less control. Uh, but my suspicion is that uh, when the league uh, launches and grows and just gets bigger in popularity, um, some of that, the, I guess, naysayers um, will come along for the ride because it's, um, it's now perhaps um, uh, more mature than what it was in the past. Cool, thank you. Hi, Nick. From I'm sorry, last question. Uh, Nick from Brock Sport Management. Um, I just have a question about like mainstream pro sports teams and their investments into esports. Uh, I've seen them do it two ways. I've seen like the 2K League, all the teams have their own subsidiary team that they own and operate. But I've also seen some teams like in Europe, PSG, um, they just kind of slap their name on an existing esports team and then that kind of creates new interest in them. So I just was curious on your thoughts of which format you think is the future for esports. Take that. Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so I think for us, we're just following a path that makes sense for us, which was we've kind of got this three-pronged approach right now, which is one is, you know, we were learning early. So our goal was to learn through our leagues. And because our leagues were getting involved in esports between the NBA 2K League and MLS had the, you know, individual competitors competing in the FIFA World Cup. Uh, and then the NHL has basically supported teams running their own, you know, programs for fans. So we saw that as a good entry point just because it is, we're familiar with hockey, basketball, and soccer, and when we think it's, it's uh, something we can sort of extend and dip a toe in the water. I think secondly was to be able to hold events, and, and like the League of Legends event, we, we intend to hold more events, and we've held some now at multiple venues, so we think that that's part of who we are. I think so, I can't speak for other pro sports organizations. Our mission was let's do what we do really well and learn along the way versus let's try to learn and you know m try to figure it out as uh, you know on the fly so i think we've kind of been more of an evolutionary trait than you know <laughs> jumping into the deep end uh, my uh, build on that would i'd say i'd be weary to take a pro sports brand and slap it onto an esports team and i'd be very careful doing that um, just because a pro sports brand might have a, a whole lot of equity doesn't mean that it has that equity amongst uh, an esports endemic uh, audience so I'd say if you do go down that direction, I would make sure that you've got the, the research and the findings and you're feeling really confident in doing so. Uh, otherwise, you might end up with a pro sports brand in an esports space with, space with a bunch of endemics that don't like it. Uh, so, yeah. uh, and that was supposed to be the last question, but my niece has actually been standing there for a while, so I'm going to allow her to speak. <laughs> Hi, uh, Morgan Craven. I'm a digital product owner with uh, Sportsnet. So my She's not really my niece, I'm just... <laughs> uh, so my question to you is, obviously the needs of the esports consumer are already being met with Twitch and other organizations, so where do the traditional broadcaster and media fit, the TSNs, the sports nets, where do we fit in this esports world? Uh, I think it's, to be really blunt, it's by working with all of us. <laughs> I think there's everything, everybody on this panel is doing something that's gonna create more enthusiasm and enjoyment for this if you're a fan. So it's, you know, it's all content. And I think if, uh, you know, broadcasters are thinking about how to attract a digital audience, it's easier for bringing people to your digital property than maybe bringing them to the linear if they're not already a, a linear, you know, con customer. So it's just like, it's a natural behavior, but you're just introducing so, you know, somebody new to the, the equation. I think that we know obviously with, you know, with games, you know, like DraftKings and the future of where sports betting is going, I think in every market that that's something that drives a lot of engagement when it's done responsibly. So I think that we see that's something that's appealing to fans and as interesting. And I think there's gonna be content that comes out of that that makes a viewing experience, you know, better. I think that the live, you know, the events um, at the grassroots level, I think that Anthony is doing, it brings people out and it creates enthusiasm, right? And then, and there's no question that what we're doing, I think whether it's pro sports, whether it's the sports titles or the non-sports uh, titles, you know, this is pro sports as well. So it's not an either or thing anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all here. I think it's just gonna keep growing. So for me, the answer is more listen to your audience and, and find ways to give them the content that they want. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. The panel was great. <laughs>